let's move on. The sad news came through uh, at the weekend that Eugene McGee, a GAA legend, had passed away. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we have the opportunity now to spend some time in the company of Owen Liston talking about his memories of Eugene McGee. Um, Owen, you obviously, you know, had the five in a row thwarted by uh, Eugene's Offaly team, but I guess also you had the opportunity to work with them as manager of the Compromise Rules team. So you got to know Eugene quite well. That's right, uh, Joel. Um, first of all, I'd like to just take this opportunity of offering my sympathies to his wife, Marion, his daughter, Linda, and son, Connor. But um, to getting back to your point, um, I was absolutely delighted to have the opportunity of seeing, seeing him up close in the dressing room, um, traveling over to Australia to, to take on the Australians and to see how he operated. And um, I must say, I really enjoyed seeing him up close and being in his company. And uh, it was really great. Yeah, did was there any rivalry between you guys? Given that they, he'd stopped the five in a row with that Offaly team, did that take a little bit of a time to get over? Not really. No, um, he was always very friendly with a lot of the Kerry lads. He had trained Ogie, John O'Keefe, Jackie, and Barry Walsh. Went in his UCD days. That time he was really quality coach. Uh, that was the feedback from the lads that he was training them at six thirty in the morning when. It, when they were uh, with UCD, and they had huge respect for him. So then we were always known well that any team that he was involved with was going to be well prepared and well organized. And um, but he, he he proved that with that Hoffley team that like they they got to a Leinster semi, they lost the Leinster semi, came back and won it. They got to a Leinster final and lost, and came back and won one. Got to an All Ireland semi final lost it and came back and won one, got to an All Ireland final and lost and came back and won the one in 82. So that just shows you the progression and was he learning from mistakes, was he learning, uh, improving the team? Absolutely, he was a superb coach and as I say, we, we saw that ourselves out in Australia in 1990. It's, um, it's funny when you, know, you, you look back and it's hard to put ourselves back in the mindset of that time. Um, Michael Foley's book uh, definitely really helped people kind of get a picture of exactly what the build-up to that was like, certainly from the Offaly side. The cult of the manager didn't really exist in the way that it does today. It was kind of just coming into relief, I suppose, with um, Hefo's army and Mikko really becoming two of the absolute titanic figures that they end up becoming. But there's definitely room there for Eugene McGee when you talk about... Um, the birth of the manager being central to how we talk about teams and having a philosophy and, and a, a style that they're bringing to bear as opposed to just preparing 15 individuals and saying, go out, win your battles and you'll all be grand. Yeah, well, he, his style was really about empowering players. For the first time I had seen where he, he broke the team up into different groups. If we played a challenge match, he'd break the team up into groups, get the feedback, analyse the feedback and come back with a plan. Um, you know, scientific approach, and it's kind of done everywhere now, but he, he was the first person that I saw and witnessed that, and um, he was a hard fella to pull the wool over his eyes. He was, you know, you could see that he was held in huge respect by all the players, like the, the qualities that he had of honesty, integrity, knowledgeable, you know, he, he was straight talking, but kind and friendly, and, and I remember that time even, he, he wanted to take a kind of a step back a bit and had someone else doing the training and the football and the players just weren't having it. They just went to Robbie O'Malley and said, look, Robbie, we want Eugene down here. We want to learn from him. We want to improve. And that was the respect the players had for him that time. Quite often when you go on those uh, trips abroad, and I'd imagine the night times are quite enjoyable uh, excursions uh, when, when you're abroad like that. How did Eugene reflect on those sort of moments? Eugene, uh, he, you could see he had been involved in teams quite a bit and he had no problem with, there was a time to have fun and there was time to have serious uh, preparation and he knew the time when the players needed a bit of a blowout, he knew and took part in it and enjoyed watching the lads having fun, um, but he knew then exactly when to crack the whip and when to get down to serious stuff, like any good manager would know. And... Um, I can just tell you, he was hard to pull the wool over his eyes because I, I was 33 at the time. I was very anxious to retire and just, but I, I wanted to get a last trip um, to Australia. And um, I remember I had Jacko and Trials there, had him tipped off where I wanted the ball and to make sure he was playing the ball into me. And I played a couple of good trials and I knew I had a good chance of making it, but 
he he didn't pick me. He he put me on this training panel uh, just to make sure that I didn't come out in, in totally bad shape. Like you know, and <laughs> he was smart, very intelligent man, and you know he 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 knew how to get the best out of people and um, just. The, the respect that uh, I saw firsthand from every single one of the players on that trip, and he just the way he interacted with them and he got to know them and see what makes them tick and you know and I'm absolutely certain every one of them would have had a great relationship with him for the rest of his life. You know. Yeah, I think the other thing too is that um, those trips were all successful. Did you did you guys win all of your trips down under, or what was the story? That that was the 1990 trip. Yeah, that was. I know it was a three matches or four trial um, tests that time, but um, Ireland won each of the each of the, the tests. Yeah, I, like that's kind of uh, for many people the golden era of the compromise rules, and it was still compromise rules as opposed to the international rules. And uh, I don't know, if it was just Jacko, but certainly you guys had the cut off vests and uh, the jerseys were cool. And it was the first time we'd ever kind of seen you guys all playing together in a meaningful game because at that stage too, the, um, the interprovincial competitions, the Railway Cup had kind of disappeared from public consciousness properly. So, um, like, that was a great team. It was an amazing trip to be on. It was an amazing trip and um, it is, you made friends for life. Like, that was the beauty of it. Um, Stephen O'Brien, I think, was only 19 at the time. I was 33 at the time, but we were still massive friends. And, do you know, there was some just great to meet the, the players in a social environment and in a professional environment as well and to get to know them and see how they operate and so that's that's what the whole thing is about at the end of the day you know when you meet up after 10 years 20 years 30 years and you can pick up straight away where you left off that's the beauty of sport yeah the um the was there some talk at some point that maybe they were going to compromise on the shape of the ball that you guys were going to actually play with an Aussie rules ball in one of the games that would have been, I'd say, going back in 1981, we were out there as well with the Kerry team and we had played against the Bulldogs and in the first half we'd hammered them with their own ball and then they switched to the oval ball and they'd <laughs> hammered us in the second half. But there was talk of that, but everyone knew that if, if we had switched to the oval ball, we'd have been hammered. You know, the, the skill level of the Australians with that oval ball was just, just superb and so far beyond and their fitness levels were were beyond you know it, it was a great achievement to, to be able to compete and to come up with a game that you could really have a good contest and the only the biggest advantage was that they were finding it difficult to judge the trajectory of, of the of their own ball you know Seamus Darby is obviously the the player and person I guess most uh, commonly associated with that moment in GA history that I'm sure you guys are sick to the back teeth of talking about. But where does Eugene stand for Kerry people in in that whole drama? Oh, the the, the we look being quite honest, we were gutted at the time. I personally had never lost a championship match up until that match, and um, it was my first kind of experience of losing an All Ireland final. And you were gutted absolutely for for a good few weeks after, but. Do you know, when when we look back on it and try to analyse it, um, it just showed me again, like, Eugene was, was such a good tactician. To, to, a few of the plies that we had were used against us with just a little bit of variation. For example, we had a, a, a tactic that time. Pat Spillane had begun out roaming, so Mike Sheehy or John Egan would be on my right. He'd go out and we'd create space in one of the corners, knowing that the ball would be kicked in there and... I'd run out and get it and let off the fellas coming in. That same play, only it wasn't the full forward. Matt Connor was shooting out to the corner. To Johnny Mooney used to go across to pick up the ball. But like he had seen what was working and what we had developed, and then he brought a variation to it. Like that's good coaching, and that's that's the genius that he was, you know? Yeah, so was, was there stuff that was unexpected on the day itself that you can kind of remember at the time going, oh, these guys are a bit better than we thought they were? Well, we knew they were good because they had given us a right good game in the All-Ireland semi-final and final the previous years. And um, we knew that they had some fantastic players, like, you know, Matt Connor was just a genius uh, uh, on the football field. So we knew that they had right good players. But you know what? He had the guts, like, he's half back line that time, every single one of them, Matt Lowry, uh, uh, Sean Lowry and um, Cordons and... 
and Pat Fitzgerald, you know, each one of them went up and got a point in the first half. They weren't afraid. They took us on and weren't just sitting back waiting for us to come at them. And it was a great game, and they deserved their win. And, look, we've got over it well, yeah. well at this stage, you know, I'll tell you. Yeah, you did all right for the next couple of years anyway. Owen, uh, thanks a million for joining us this morning and sharing your memories of Eugene with us. Not at all. Pleasure. It's uh, Owen the Bomber listen talking about... Eugene McGee, who um, sadly passed away at the weekend. Uh, I just want to add the bit that, like everybody's been talking about Eugene's generosity, he was endlessly generous to us here when we were getting up and running and started out. And um, I remember when we were looking for uh, rights for the first time to break the monopoly that RT Radio had, um, we canvassed various uh, grandees of the GAA to ask them to write a letter for support for us. And Eugene came back straight away with like a three-page letter saying that, you know, you need to give these guys a chance here. Um, and it was the type of thing where he, he lent the power of his reputation to us as a young team. And we were obviously always grateful for that. So, um, you know, he definitely had a sense that he wanted to pay things forward in the school of journalism. And um, that's why we were always more than happy to pick the phone up to Eugene and go, here, listen, come on in and spend some time with us. And he was always, always endlessly generous with his time as well. So, um, yeah. I hope that I hope that a little bit of the outpouring that has happened over the last couple of days kind of reflects the position that he held mm. for so many people that you know because frequently frequently we wait until people die to tell them that they're great and uh, I hope that Eugene had a sense of that beforehand. Sean Boyle is on the line with us this morning to give us his thoughts. Um, Sean, we were just here and good morning to you first and, and thanks for joining us this morning. Just a pleasure. We, we were just hearing from Owen Liston there about. Um, the international rules trips that they would have been on and of yes. course obviously the Kerry lads going up against Eugene who denied them the five in a row sure he says there was <laughs> it didn't even matter that like they were over straight away pretty much yeah it's and, and that's absolutely true and I suppose it was a measure of the man a measure of the Kerry lads as well but um, oh, I have to tell you lads, it was awful sad I couldn't believe it when I heard it because um, in ways Eugene was so serious you know and yet on a one to one he was a very witty man, and there was, there was good crack in him on a one to one. But um, uh, I just I can't believe that he's been taken so quick because he was a resilient character. Ironically, a couple of years ago, the two of us picked up a virus, and we ended up in the Bond score. And um, uh, and this was Eugene, and he was you know he just he said, "Sean, I'm grand, except this phone it never stops ringing." And I said, Judy, would you ever think of turning it off? I wouldn't like to do that, he said, in case someone's in trouble. I said, Judy, you're the one that's in trouble now. Turn it off, right? And, um, and that's, um, you know, and that's the sort he was. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be offensive. Um, incredibly driven man. Um, what he achieved, both with the lads at Sigerson, what he achieved sort of with Offaly was absolutely Immeasurable. Like at the time, it's very hard for people. People talk about the way Dublin are today, um, and here was a team, you know, so so amazingly good. And um, yes, he never deviated from what he thought was going to what was going to win it, and he got the lads to believe in it more than anything else in the world. And uh, they way, the way they achieved it, I always remember up in the, in the Hogan stand when you know Kerry got the penalty, and I remember saying to the person that was beside me, I said, look, there's no way in hell if the whole, whole lot of the carry does take this penalty is Martin Furlong that and that into the net. You know what I mean? There was a, sort of a, a it, like, it was a competitive defiance that was, was in Offaly at the time. And like having found Pat Dunn for the middle of the field and the big long arms of Pat, you know what I mean? And it was so many things that he put together. But it, he, he was lucky in this way that Father Sean Heaney, um, he knew what Eugene had, and um, he backed him the whole way. And you can imagine, you sort of, you have success at Leinster level, and you've had some great matches, and you've achieved, you're getting to the All Ireland final, and you're being beaten. And um, yes, Father Sean knew that if Eugene is there, these boys, they, these boys will pull it off. And of course, that was absolutely true. But like to achieve excellence there, but what he did as an administrator as a thinker about the game, what he did as, um, oh, as a writer. Oh, in every walk of life, he was extraordinary. Even the last general election, Connie Gertie was standing for Fianna Fáil below in Longford. There was another man standing for Fianna Gael uh, below in Longford. And he wanted them 
the ones and twos to go to them so that they have a TD in Longford. And, of course, it didn't work out. The parties wouldn't allow it, right? So Longford have no TD. You know what I mean? But it was for Longford. And what was right for Longford and what was right for everything he ever did, that's the way Eugene was. He just went to, at it wholeheartedly. And um, in a way, he couldn't let go of it. So to Marion and Connor and sister, like, it's, just, it's just such a tragedy for them. And I'm awful sorry. Yeah. Sean, the, the, just to go back to the bit that you were talking about, people, it's very hard, I think, for anybody to get their head around the notion that Offaly could build year after year after year after year to get to the point where they were All-Ireland contenders when you consider just the, the size of the population that the county has and, and where we are now. But if you were to go yeah. back to, to that time and that era, um, how important was it that you were able to look at somebody like what Eugene had done with Offaly and talk to your Meath team about, look what these lads are doing. Like, it's not, you know... Well... I would have talked always about the good work Kevin Heffern and Eugene McGee. And, um, oh, and, you know, Kevin got be good to him, understand it. I know Mikko does understand it. Um, like, we, after they won the All Ireland, he was in charge of Leinster. And um, in a challenge match, he played me. And he must have spent an hour talking to me. Like, remember, they're All Ireland champions. You know what I mean? Like, often you're All Ireland champions. And, um, he must have spent an hour talking to me. And um, I will never forget the words of wisdom, the words of advice, the calmness that was there, the matter-of-fact way he had it going on. And um, I would always have been terribly thankful to him for, first of all, you know, I was a rookie. I was only starting off, you know what I mean, that he acknowledged you. But he spoke to you as if you were after winning an All-Ireland yourself. You know what I mean? And I love I loved that about him. In other words, that if you were looking after... My mother's county, Leitrim, or you were looking after, you know, Antrim in football or whatever it was, Eugene spoke to you as if you were Kerry or Dublin or Offaly or Cork. Do you understand? Yeah. He spoke to you on that level and he made you think like that. And I'd be forever grateful to him for that. Sean, thanks a million for joining us this morning and sharing your memories as well. Ger Owen, thanks very much, Lance, and thank you so much. It's Sean Boyle and giving us some thoughts there and we'd also like to pass on our condolences to uh, to everybody in the family and particularly to Connor who worked with us here for a while um, about five or six years ago. We know him really well and we obviously hope that himself and his sister and his mum were doing well.